Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have a story where somebody spilled chloroform and it melted their shoes. I was in grade 7 or 8, and I live in a post-Soviet country, so I'd gotten a kilogram of chromium trioxide from somewhere. Anyway, I'd heard that chromium trioxide reacts violently with organic solvents, so absolutely I had to try it out. First I tried it with ethanol, and it was spectacular, but then I had the bright idea to try it with acetone. I put about 20 to 30 grams of chromium trioxide on a metal plate and poured some acetone on it. I expected a flame immediately, like with ethanol, so I ran away after pouring. After 10 seconds, nothing had happened, but the chromium trioxide was going black, so I decided to inspect it, and right when I was close to it, it exploded, spraying me with chromium trioxide acetone mixture. Oh my gosh. I quickly took off all of my clothes and rushed to the shower. Luckily, I wore safety goggles, and I later learned about the carcinogenic effects of chromium trioxide. I'm well now, but the chromium stains were on me for a week. That's so awful to hear. If you don't know the hazards associated with mixing different chemicals, it's definitely not something you should be doing. You're lucky that you didn't get permanently harmed, but yeah, high valent chromium salts are definitely carcinogenic. I remember that one time I was at a customer's business and they were moving high pressure gas bottles up some stairs with the regulator still attached. For those who are unfamiliar, this is a really dangerous way to transport a cylinder because it can make it even easier to break off the very top of the cylinder, which can explode and it's absolutely tragic when it happens. I was keeping my distance from the soon-to-be accident. The next thing I know, the gas bottle was dropped, so I threw myself behind the nearest concrete pillar, as I didn't wish to be flattened. As luck would have it, the neck of the bottle wasn't broken off, just the regulator. When the head of the department found out, he smacked the guys around the head, and told them to never do anything like that again. This is extremely serious, and it's something that you need to be really careful about. Another one to do with gas cylinders was someone had the bright idea, because they didn't like which side of the regulator the cylinder was on, to have a regulator on the right-hand side of the cylinder. What he didn't take note of was that the regulator has a high pressure and a low pressure side. So the second he opened the regulator, he managed to send himself flying backwards as he'd ruptured the diaphragm and sent the back of the regulator shooting into his chest. Luckily, he was just bruised. He's lucky that he didn't rupture his own diaphragm. When I used to do home chemistry, I used to keep all of my waste in plastic bottles as I didn't want to dispose of it irresponsibly until the police thought that I had a drug lab. I didn't. I just had most of the chemicals to do it and disposed of all of my mercury and other waste for me for free. But when I moved out of my home, my mom just flushed all of my chemicals down the toilet. Red phosphorus, formaldehyde, acetic anhydride, mercury salts, lead salts, things that do not belong down the toilet. So all of my trying to stop contaminants from getting into the environment was wasted. This is sad. This is a sad story. But it's cool that the police took all those chemicals off your hands for you for free. I think that's a really great policy. The following is not really a lab accident, but something that someone who's into chemistry and its accidents should have known better about. In order to fully appreciate the story, I'll have to backtrack with some background information. Starting as a kid at the age of 10, me and my dad, who's a firefighter, performed a flower dust explosion experiment in our garden every year. It's great family fun, easy to set up, and it instills sensibilities into the kids for the dangers of combustible dust clouds. We got a more sophisticated setup and tried to increase the combustion and size of the fireball, but at its core, it's just a burner as an ignition source, a hose with flour in it pointed upwards, and an air pump, and a lot of fun. However, let's get to the point. Yesterday, I was setting up the barbecue. I had already prepared the wood starter fire and was getting the coal when I noticed that there was just enough coal left in the bag for grilling, so I decided to just pour it in. I turned the bag upside down above the grill, and the following happened in a few milliseconds. 1. I saw a black dust cloud coming out of the bag. 2. My brain drew the parallels to the experiments with my dad. And 3. While I was still processing my mistakes, the fireball singed the hair on my arms. To add insult to injury, I dropped the paper coal bag which promptly caught on fire, and startled by that, I touched the red-hot side panel of the barbecue. Oh no! Luckily, I was wearing leather gloves, so my hands weren't hurt, but the gloves got ruined nonetheless. Quick PSA, if you're wearing leather gloves and you touch something hot, shake them off your hands immediately. They can keep away the heat for a while, but if they are heated past a certain point, they will shrink, get stuck to your hands, and burn them. So lesson learned. Think about what you are doing before something bad happens, and be aware that danger lurks not just in the lab but also at home. This is definitely a good takeaway, and I want to highlight here that flammable powder fires are no joke. You'd think that if they're not a solvent, if they're not volatile, they won't be flammable, but that's definitely not the case. Flour can be extremely dangerous, and even powdered sugar can pose safety hazards, as has been illustrated by the US Chemical Safety Board. I'll include a link to that in the description. Today's Yikes Awardee is the Dutch word for egg. On the note of dodgy disposal methods, a friend of mine who was an undergrad chem student at the time somehow got some picric acid. His girlfriend didn't want him to have explosives in their apartment, which is understandable, so he gave me a 50 mil grad cylinder full of dry picric acid. That is terrible. Picric acid is extremely unstable when it's dry. Usually it's stored wet with water to prevent it from being as explosive. Transporting this was a blast, to say the least. Pun definitely intended. When I came home, I first of all carefully phlegmatized it with a whole bunch of water and transferred it into a plastic bottle. 
Phlegmatization is just a way to render an explosive less explosive, far away from any metal contamination. Pick rates are also even more explosive when they're metal pick rates, so contaminating picric acid with metal is a great way to have an accidental explosion. Now I have some chemical sample which is at least somewhat legal to own and looks nifty. I'm pretty sure in the Netherlands the police will take any of your chemical waste away for free, at least that's what I've heard from people in the Discord. I would encourage you to get rid of that through legal, safe means, rather than putting yourself in harm's way. The worst thing I've ever done with chemicals and stuff was back when I was in high school. We had a co-op work placement program, and I got brought into a tire shop for a semester. Well, one of the jobs I was given later in said co-op was to clean out the shop's floor pit, which was nicely filled with oily, greasy sludge. The shop owner, environmentalist that he was, told me that the only place we could dispose of it was in the trees behind the shop. Oh no! Oh, that's terrible. Sadly, 16-year-old me didn't realize how terrible that actually was to do, and just did as I was told. Rip. This is so sad to hear, and it's terrible that people take advantage of kids like that. I'm a grad student in life sciences. I don't really understand chemistry much, but the dilution is the solution to pollution story made me remember the time that I was working with a drug that was hazardous to aquatic life. I asked if we had a waste container I could pour the waste in, and she just told me to pour it down the drain and run the tap for a while while I was working with a very low concentration. I was confused because that's still going to be in the water and still harm whatever's in it, right? I had a chemistry lecturer back in undergrad who lost her stuff at people pouring things down the drain, so it really stuck with me. My advisor is a very temperamental person, and I was afraid of her at that point in my career, so I did as she said, but left the water running over the weekend. I wish I would have grown a spine earlier and told her off, but this was months back when I first joined the lab. Yeah, it's sorry to hear that. I always wonder about stuff like that because maybe it doesn't make a big impact, and you'll never know if it does, but your conscience will always be sad with you, no matter what. Feels bad. This is today's big story. I'm not a chemist. My sister was in college working on a biology degree. In her biochemistry lab, she and her partner worked with a focus on compounds that dissolve in chloroform. Chloroform, she told me, is a really powerful organic solvent and would readily dissolve standard nitrile gloves. This is true. Turns out that the chloroform would also dissolve the plastic centrifuge tubes that the undergrads would use, so she and her partner purchased some nice Teflon tubes to use when centrifuging anything with chloroform. My sister didn't exactly trust the other undergrads to take care of the Teflon tubes, so she kept them in a cupboard that usually wouldn't be accessed by other students. This cupboard contained other things that the chloroform specialists would use. One day, my sister reaches up into the cupboard to grab the Teflon tubes, which had been slid to the back behind a 5-liter flask of recycled, redistilled chloroform, and a fragile distillation column. As she pulled the Teflon tubes out from the back, she accidentally slid both the 5-liter flask and the distillation column forward out of the cupboard, and chose to catch the wrong thing, the distillation column. About 4 liters of chloroform spilled all over the counter and floor, melting people's shoes and giving the floor a new paint job. Oh no, that's awful. That's so awful to hear. I've had it quite often when working with acetone and other solvents in the lab that your shoe will be in contact with the acetone for a little bit too long, and then my shoes will just get stuck to the floor, and then you have to, like, peel it off. It was such an issue, in fact, that any time I got a pair of shoes that was bound together with glue, it would sooner or later just detach. So I had to go to different shoe stores and specifically get shoes that had stitching to prevent the bottom from separating from the top of the shoe. You might think that this is overkill, but after having my shoes separate several times, I got really frustrated with it. And this is something that isn't discussed very much in chemistry circles. The glue that's present in shoes can often be removed using the solvents in the lab, and so if you just have solvent vapors all the time, that can cause it to separate, which is not ideal. I worked at a major biochem company, and some of the products we produced for custom orders were like $1.5 million or more for less than a liter of solution. I can definitely see the quality control guy getting regular work orders that would overcome his salary. That is insane. It is amazing to me that a liter of anything could cost $1.5 million. That is absolutely bonkers. If you guys have any instances where you can think of solutions that a liter would cost that much, I'd love to hear them down below. A while back, I got some expired bottles of isopropyl ether, terbutyl ether, and several other, um, very dangerous chemicals for free from a chemical recycling company. If that's how the chemical recycling companies have been recycling our chemicals, I think one of us should probably look into that. The ethers were cleared of peroxides by reacting them with potassium iodide, while being magnetically stirred in a large flask. It was then separated from the now brown potassium iodide solution. The ethers were next gently reacted with calcium hydride to remove residual water and any iodine from them. Finally, the ethers were distilled and transferred to a new container that was backfilled with an argon fill. These heavier ethers are nice for certain reactions, but to be honest, should be avoided and substituted if you can. The crystals of diisopropyl ether peroxide are stupidly sensitive and explosive, by the way, far worse than even that which shall not be named. So if you get a bottle of diisopropyl ether with visible crystals in it, treat it like a bomb. It's seriously so dangerous. We've talked about this diisopropyl ether peroxide before in a couple different compilations. And I actually have a video about the formation of peroxides in ethers that I'll include in the description. 
I can't wait for the Morbius strip molecule. My favorite part is when it said, it's Morbin time, and proceeded to morb every other molecule. With that, I hope you've enjoyed this episode, and I hope you have a great day.